uncertainties. As soon as my clock strikes six, we will launch into the presentation. It will take around 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, depending on how much I talk, uh, which I obviously clearly like to, to do. And uh, we will cover hopefully everything that uh, students will need to hit the top bands on the internal assessment criteria. Right guys, so welcome along, six o'clock on the bell. So the essential understandings for what we're going to be doing this evening. Uh, we're looking at the IB expectations, what do they want? Different types of errors. Let's have a look at the significant figures, which is something which uh, I often mark IAs down for. Um, the difference between precision accuracy, reliability, validity, if I can talk. Scientific notation, common errors, what to do when you're adding or subtracting uncertainties, multiplying and dividing, and what to do when you have logarithmic values or natural logs. How do you cope with those as um, uncertainties? Finally, we'll have a quick look at the uncertainty treatment in a recent internal assessment. Uh, it was a very good internal assessment, but there were some errors that are in there. We'll have a look at those. So when we have a look at what the IB say, the IB make particular reference to uncertainty in three criteria. They look at exploration, analysis, and evaluation, where clearly uh, they are talking about reliability, they're talking about significant factors that can affect the relevance, uh, consideration of the impact of uncertainty, clearly in analysis, and in evaluation, limitations of the data in terms of the analysis of the sources of error. I would actually extend that to include definitely communication because if you're not um, taking note of your significant figures, decimal places, you're not rounding correctly at the appropriate point, that clearly shows that you uh, are not communicating very well and that clearly indicates that personal engagement may well be impacted as well. So perhaps one of the uh, top things you can do in terms of influencing being of top bands in your internal assessment Make sure that your uncertainties are absolutely uh, correct. Just to clarify, a couple of errors will not make a massive difference, but consistently making the same error and making lots of errors with such basics as decimal places and sig figs can land you in the middle or even lower on the bands for exploration, analysis and uh, communication. So students should uh, make note of systematic and random errors. Again, this is from the IB. This is not Mr. Midgley saying you have to do this. This is what the IB is saying. Make a record of the uncertainty range. Um, take note of significant figures. Propagate the uncertainties through a calculation. So this is not just the mark of a top scoring IA. This should be the mark of every IA which is submitted. Functions such as addition, subtraction, absolute uncertainties, that, that has a value. Um, you can add them. And then it's saying multiplication, division and powers. Percentages can be added. And I always taught um, the powers or raising something through an exponent. You take the percentage and you add it. But that's easier said than done. And I found a new method, which was from a physics friend. Um, and I'll share that with you during this session today. Uncertainty can be satisfied by drawing best fit curves. You can have a best fit a line of best fit or a curve of best fit, as you know. And it does always say chemistry students do not have to do error bars. Um, I do find error bars, um, they're not expected, but they are very valuable. And uh, in terms of data and analyzing the systematic and the random errors, I think they are indispensable. And we'll have a look at those today. Your conclusion should reference your systematic or further random errors that you were encountered, should comment on the precision and accuracy, and suggest how you can reduce the random and maybe eliminate the systematic errors. Okay. Underlined here, random can be reduced by taking repeated readings, but systematic cannot. Systematic will refer to your, your method or inherent errors in the manner in which you are collecting data. So what's human error? Well, human error is not dropping a solution or mistaking a reading because you were not level with the scale. Do, be careful when you're talking about human error, okay? It's not putting your hand up and saying, yes, I'm an idiot, okay? That's not going to get your marks. That might well lose you marks. When we say human error, we mean limitations as a human, as a measuring device. 
all digital stopwatches go to two decimal places. The precision is the second decimal place. The accuracy is not to two decimal places. The accuracy is to the human being and a human being's reaction time, which is round about plus or minus one a second. Try it yourself. So what are systematic errors? I probably just mentioned they're caused by poor design. So maybe your technique was was poor. We do expect that people collecting data use the most accurate uh, piece of glassware or um, measurement apparatus which is available in a common high school laboratory. So if you're doing a titration, we don't expect you to be using a beaker. We expect you to be using a burette, of course. Systematic cannot be reduced by repetition, but you can improve the method. If you're looking at a disappearing cross, you could perhaps use a colorimeter. If you're looking at changes in color, you can download the uh, Google Science Journal app and you can measure the amount of transmitted red, green and blue light. So these all reduce systematic errors. Here's something to scare you a little bit. A data set with a systematic error can be very reliable. Reliable, that means you come out with the same thing each time. But it'll be wrong in, in the same direction each time. So it is reliable, but not accurate. So be careful with the language that we are using around these words. It may even be poss not be possible to identify a systematic error in a data set. So how do you know you have a systematic error in a data set? We'll come to that later. Typical systematic errors I'd expect to find in the evaluation. Um, the position of a mis meniscus, uh, obviously you know that's parallax error. Is parallax error random error or is it systematic error? Um, we'll come to that shortly. You could lose heat in the classic enthalpy of combustion experiments. Heat is lost to the surroundings. That's a systematic error. If you're using a dirty pipette, I suggest you clean it before you use it and don't mention it in the IA. And classically, uh, balance being out of calibration are all systematic errors. Random errors are the things that you find printed on things. Things like this balance is calibrated and is accurate to within 0.01 grams. That's an example of a random error. Because we as humans are limited by the accuracy of the instruments, but also by our own capabilities. And often errors are made between expecting a human being to measure something to a first or even a second decimal place I've seen when clearly we are not that accurate as a species. Don't forget about anomalies. How do you treat anomalies? This one comes up quite a lot. You can circle and highlight it and deal with it in that way. Uh, you can discuss it in the evaluation. It's wonderful uh, food for thought in the evaluation when you're saying which was uh, removed or included. But seriously, if you have time to redo the experiment, redo it, check the error and still talk about it in your evaluation. Then finally, there's gross error. Now be careful here. It goes back to the original point at the beginning. Don't put your hand up and say that um, I dropped the whole reaction on the floor and therefore my results were uh, erroneous. The moderator is not going to give you any marks for that and may well raise questions about your uh, personal engagement or application within your IA. So the human error, systematic error, random error and gross error. So let's have a look at some common random errors we would expect to find in a high school laboratory. Here we have a beaker, a 100 mil, 100 cm cubed beaker. What's the uncertainty on the beaker? Bit of a trick question, really. Who cares? I would never, ever use this, and neither would a student in my laboratory, would never use this beaker to, me to measure anything other than just for storing a chemical if they'd taken it from a Winchester, to pour it into there and then decant it into something which we could use for measuring. Okay, These are produced by the thousand... They all fly past the printer. This scale is just arbitrarily uh, painted on. Do not ever use these fonts. They are merely just for holding things um, and, and for heating as well because it's Pyrex. Okay, so no, uh, just don't accept it. A volumetric flask. Uh, this volumetric flask uh, I found in our, our laboratory yesterday. It has plus or minus 0 0.12 cm cubed for 250 cm cubed. 
So that's 0 0.12 in 250 times 100 will give you the percentage uncertainty. Now obviously be careful because this only holds true at 20 degrees C. If you're not at 20 degrees C, obviously if you're cooler, the glass will shrink. If you're hotter, the glass will expand and it will no longer be 250 cm cubed plus or minus 0 0.12 cm cubed. So be careful of the temperature you're using things. This is a pipette. Again, I found in our laboratory yesterday. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is one. This is one cm cubed. So one division is 0 0.1 cm cubed. So half the smallest division is 0 0.05 cm cubed. So depending on the volume you're decanting, if it's 5 cm cubed, it's going to be 0 0.05 in 5 cm cubed. My mental math says that's a 1% error. Okay. So what I'm doing in my head, and we could do on a calculator, is convert them into percent uncertainties. Then you can add them together. Here's a standard thermometer. Um, it was obviously the AC was on in our laboratory yesterday, so that's at 20, let's call that 23 point zero degrees C. Now each division is one degree C, so half the smallest division is 0 0.5 degrees C. So that's 23 degrees C plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees C. Cool. But be careful, I almost went on, be careful. If you're doing delta T, so you're doing a start temperature and an end temperature, that means you're uncertain for half a de 0 0.5 degrees C at the start temperature and 0 0.5 degrees C at the end temperature. So if it's delta T, then the uncertainty is plus or minus 1 degrees C. Significant figures are worth mentioning. Why? Because students get them wrong quite a lot. So just some reminders. Non-zero numbers are significant zeros between non-zeros are significant. It's the things that are interesting and the things that are important. Leading zeros are not significant. They don't add any value to the number. We could put them in scientific notation and they would not hold any more or less value than if they were there. Trailing zeros to the right are significant because we are saying that the precision is to that many number of decimal places. Trailing zeros in a whole number, however, with the decimal shown, are significant. Let's have a look. This is a data table from a recent internal assessment which the uh, student submitted. So let's have a look at this together. Um, on the left hand side we have temperature in Kelvin which is plus or minus 0 0.5 Kelvin. One decimal place. All the data has one decimal place. That's great. Period of oscillation is plus or minus 0 0.5 seconds, which is one decimal place. And all the data has one decimal place. So reading left to right, the temperature looks good. I'm giving a tick as a moderator. The treatment of number is good. The period of oscillation is good. And then the average, um, I was taken aback by the average. Why am I taken aback by the average? Well, if I was a mean moderator, and they do exist, um, we could look at this and say, well, what are the units? Clearly the seconds, clearly the seconds. But she doesn't say that they're seconds. And all of a sudden, because the line is there between the three trials and the average, there is no uncertainty and there is no units. And also, you can argue both ways, but the student has chosen to lose the decimal place. I know by saying this, some people will be running around the room, screaming from the rooftops. When you average three numbers with one decimal place, you have no decimal places in the average. And I have found that on some math websites. I did research this presentation this evening. And others say you should leave it there. The thing is, you need to be consistent. Okay, if you do the same thing, thing throughout your IA and it's defensible, and both ways are defensible on that one, I think, in my humble opinion, um, then that's fine. Would I mark her down for not putting the units and the uncertainty on the average? No, I would absolutely not mark her down for that. But if she did it again, maybe I'd be thinking, mm, maybe one mark is going down. 
If you did it another time, I'm definitely knocking a mark off. So again, keep things at the back of your head. Uh, thanks to Lawrence Cock um, for letting me screenshot this from his slides. I didn't ask him, but I've referenced it at the end. I hope that was okay, Lawrence. What's this talking about? This is now talking about the uh, significant figures and when you should do rounding. So there is uh, still evidence of premature rounding in internal assessments, which scares me a bit. So both have three significant figures on the left and the right. Both are times by uh, 291. On the left hand side, we are leaving all the numbers on the calculator. Do not round up or down in an intermediate step because then we're going to divide by 0 0.125. This looks like moles times temperature divided by moles. Um, we'll see what, what it comes out to. If you don't round in the intermediate step, you end up with an answer, three sig figs, 0 0.156, or 1 1.56 by 10 to the minus 1 in scientific notation, which we'll have a look at in a moment. On the right-hand side, however, the first step gave us 0 0.0195843. The student has rounded this to 0 0.0196, divided by 0.125, which gave us 0.1568, giving a rounding off error. So it got one, 0 0.157. On mark schemes, in exams, you will find that the correct answer is the correct answer. And if you don't follow your significant figures on IA and in exams, you are not going to get the correct answer. Decimal places. Precision is only to the least number of decimal places in any value being considered. So left hand side, we have three decimal places, one decimal place, two decimal places. So the answer clearly has three decimal places, but the precision can only be to the least number of decimal places in any value. So the least number on the correct side is one decimal place. So my answer must also have one decimal place. So the correct answer is 122.8. Incorrect is leaving it at three decimal places and having six significant figures as well, which is just barking mad. I hope you agree. Precision versus accuracy. Uh, students, I hope the students all, all know this, um, quick reminder, I'm, I was always taught this as gunfire on the battlefield and when soldiers used to shoot the guns, the barrel of the gun was, was always bent and when they first shot they were uh, board number three, they were neither precise nor accurate, they just went all over the place. As time went on, the precision improved but the accuracy did not, so they were all bunched in one place, so soldiers learnt to shoot to the left or to the right or to the top or the bottom to, to counteract the poor calibration of the gun. And then of course finally we started to get a bit more precision and a bit more accuracy which would be two until we come to nowadays and uh, people can uh, use guns highly effectively and hit the target with precision all bunched together and also be accurate which is great for the soldier not so great for the target. So precision is the degree of reproducibility between repeat measurements. The more you make, the better the precision. That's why in the IA, we always expect results in, in triplicate. A few teachers, teachers have said, do it four times, five times, because that will get you a higher mark. I've never heard or been told that I, I don't subscribe. Triplicate is fine. So when you're in your evaluation, how do you improve the accuracy of your results? Well, first of all, you need to calculate how close it is to the theoretical value. Okay, you make percentage fits. If you've done an activation energy, you can find activation energies and do how close it is percent-wise to the accepted value. You can improve accuracy by calibrating the equipment, or you can do it by perhaps substituting a more uh, sophisticated piece of kit which has more precision and hopefully more accuracy as well to give you a value closer to the accepted value. Reliability is not a huge thing that they emphasize in, uh, in chemistry, but it is there, the word is there at the beginning. 
So repeat single measurements. You can improve it by fixing the control variables and the choice of equipment. One of the main th many things that Mark I have Mark's IA is down for is when a student is changing, for instance, temperature. And then within the method, they don't say how they will effectively control the temperature. So we say we're doing it at 20 degrees C, 30 degrees C, 40 degrees C, for instance. And they say, I use a water bath for my 20 degrees C, my 30 degrees C, and my 40 degrees C. But that, that, does, that is unreliable because a water bath has an arbitrary scale on the front, which is printed with the temperature, but we don't, we don't trust that. We have to, to prove that. We are, we are scientists. We are, we are skeptical, critical thinkers. Another thing that students do is they put a thermometer in the water bath, not actually in the tube or the reaction that they are measuring. And again, that gives unreliable data. So to improve it, um, you can increase the number of repetitions and then do a line of best fits. Validity, how valid is it? The method must test the research question. Every moderator is looking, does the method test the research question? Has the students considered all of the variables? And this you, you know from your chemistry education, you know from standing back and actually putting the rubric away and just looking at the IA as a whole and saying, does this actually make chemical sense? Is it sound? Okay. You've got to ensure all the assumptions are satisfied. If you're using the ideal gas equation, you shouldn't be using the largest molecule you can find. It shouldn't be at massively low temperature or, or massively high pressure because it's, it's going to give non-ideal behavior. And you should know that as an IB student. One of my proofreaders, and I'm very grateful to my proofreaders, uh, I shall name drop here, Richard Thornley proofread this presentation uh, yesterday. Thank you, Richard. And he, this is the one error, he said, that was in this presentation. Can anybody see what the error is? Okay, the problem is, it says, there were a times 10 to the power n, where 1 is less than or equal to a, which is less than or greater than or equal to 10, is incorrect. It should be less than or equal to 9.99999, you get the idea, 9.9 .9 recurring. Because standard form is here, the full number, and scientific notation is here. And we expect scientific notation. In lots of the IAs, it's going to be 10 to the power of minus. It doesn't matter. It should still be a number between 1 and 10 times 10 to the power of however many decimal places are following after the number. Okay, so those are the rules there. I'm not going to get bogged down in the mathematical rules of it. Uh, use scientific notation, use it correctly, and you'll be fine. Experimental uncertainties we do to one sig fig, one significant figure because we can't be any more precise than the best estimate that we can possibly have. Another rule which is often broken, the least number of sig figs in any number of the problem determines the number of significant figures in the answer. What does that mean? The number of sig figs in any number of the problem determines the number of sig figs in it. You cannot have an answer which has greater sig figs than the numbers you've put in. But watch your decimal places. Watch your decimal places. So two types of uncertainty. We have absolutes. This has a number. We have units. So for instance, a length may be reported as 7.3 plus or minus 0.2. So we're only certain that the value is somewhere between well, 0.2 from 7.3 to 7.1 and add 0.2 to 7.3 to 7.5. So it's somewhere between 7.1 and 7.5. So absolute uncertainties always have the same units as the reported value with which they are associated. The one that we're perhaps more familiar with is the relative uncertainty. And that usually comes down to a percentage of the value. So a length of 100 cm plus or minus 1 cm has a relative uncertainty of 1% or one part per 100. Don't forget these are always units less, but obviously they have a percentage value. You can change that percentage value by taking the percentage uncertainty, multiplying it by the result, and that will take it back into the units, whichever it was. In this case, it's 2.042 plus or minus 0 0.006. So absolute and relative uncertainty 
are obviously interchangeable. If it's just percent, times it by the value that you've got, the result, and it gives you the absolute uncertainty. A common method used is, is this, and I do advocate use of this method. Why do I advocate use of this method? It's simple, I can understand it. It's straightforward, and it hits the top criteria, okay? So this is the max min half range method. So here we've got four pieces of data, 5.42, 5.68, 5.75, and 5.79. We could just average it, we just take the mean, Add them together, divide it by 4, 3 sig fig, 2 dp, all the way through 5.66. We've got the average, but what's the uncertainty on the average? Well, if we take the top and the bottom of the range, the top is clearly 5.79. Take that away from 5.42, which is the bottom, divide it by 2, and you get a plus or minus a 0 0.185. So this is the half range method. After this presentation, I'll link the document underneath the video, which will be posted. And there are some uh, worksheets that you can do uh, to check that you understand the half range method. There are also um, many other ways you can treat your uncertainty. This is a video which is on my channel, which is done by a biology colleague who does t-test and uh, standard deviation and uh, chi-squared or chi-squared tests. Um, find that on my channel, uh, but that, that is purely for IB biology and it goes into a lot more depth than we need for IA chemistry. So don't do more than you really have to do. Okay, how do we get errors into our IA? Well, there are random errors. These are the things that we got from the measurements. So zero, plus or minus 0 0.05 is standard error on a burette, half the smallest division. If you have a start volume and an, L, an end volume, so it's delta V, you add them together and it's plus or minus 0 0.1 cm cubed. If you're multiplying or dividing, you can use the percentage uncertainties. So here we have sodium hydroxide, one mole per decimeter cubed, plus or minus 0 0.05. The percentage is 0 0.05 over one, because that's the concentration times 100, so it's 5%. The volume, though, is 10 cm cubed, and the uncertainty is plus or minus 0 0.1 cm cubed. So the percentage uncertainty is 0 0.1 over 10 times 100. Therefore, the calculated moles is 1 times 10 over 1,000, which is 0 0.01 moles, which is plus or minus 6%. Okay, get the percentage, add it together. 5 plus 1, 6, done. You can interchange between the two. I took this straight from the IB teacher support material. A common protocol is the final total percentage uncertainty should be cited to no more than one sig fig if it's greater than 2% and no more than two sig fig if it's less than 2%. I would just leave it one sig fig, but, but that's just me. Again, as long as you are consistent, then that's, that's perfectly okay. The root sum of square, I've seen this in, I think it's in the Pearson textbook. It's not required, but if you want to do it, knock yourself out. Adding and subtracting uncertainties. Again, you would uh, merely, let's have a look at the adding here. It's got 3.4 plus or minus 0.2 plus 2.1 plus or minus 0.1. So that's 3.4 plus 2.1, which is obviously 5.5. And then just add the uncertainty. 0 0.2, 0 0.1 is 0 0.3 cm. Taking away 3.4, take away 2.1. It's going to be 1.3, but the uncertainty is 0 0.2 and 0 0.1. Just add it together. 1.3 plus or minus 0 0.3. Again, you can convert that, that percentages. 0 0.3 over 1.3 times 100 would give you the percent uncertainty. What about multiplying and dividing? Well, do the same. Just add the percentage uncertainties. 3.4 by 1.5 is going to be 5.1, but the uncertainty is 5.9 and 4.1. So add them together it's going to be 10%. 3.4 divided by 1.7 is, I'm going to accept that is, that is 2, obviously, and 5.9 and 4.1, just add them together, is 10%. So if you're dividing something, add the percentages. Multiplying something, add the percentages. Okay. Let's look at the student's data again. Same student, D, 
different parts of hair IA. Here's the temperature, consistent decimal places, that's good. The rate is s to the minus 1, we can look in the previous part of the IA, her raw data is there, that, that did check out, that's fine. She's average and then she's used standard deviation. You can use standard deviation, that's absolutely fine, you can just take it from the Excel graph and it will tell you. Um, or you can calculate it. She's a biology student, that's why she chose standard deviation and that's why she achieved good marks on this IA. The rate constants are tabulated beautifully here. She's got a temperature, uh, standard notation, 10 to the minus 3 in Kelvin. There's no uncertainty. Mm, oh no, it's here. The uncertainty is here. That's good. The rate constant with the units. These units are bizarre. Mole to the minus 7, DM21, <laughs> S to the minus 1, and LNK. Now LNK, we should have an uncertainty on. But she's done probably what I told her to do at the time. I've only found out the new method when I researched this presentation. So this is good. Percent uncertainty, excellent. Temperature, great. And then the absolute uncertainty of temperature. So it's clear when I'm reading this as a moderator precisely what she's done. And we're pretty happy with what she's done so far. This is perhaps one of the most important things in the presentation. She's plotted a graph. We can see rate on the y-axis, initial temperature of reaction on the x-axis. We can see an uncertainty uh, on the x-axis, that's for temperature of the reaction. And crucially, we can see both longitudinal and latitudinal error bars. I can see an R-squared value, which I'm sure she talked about in her internal assessment. Um, and what I can also see, which I don't see very often, which I always encourage my students to do this, is a maximum and minimum gradient. Why, why do I do that? It's because I, I love Excel. No, I don't, I don't love Excel. I do this, and this goes back to the comments earlier about talking about the magnitude of your systematic errors in your evaluation. The way I teach it is this. If your maximum and your minimum gradient go through all of your error bars, that means you have controlled all of the random and systematic errors in your experiments. Let's imagine you have calibrated for all of your random errors. Those error bars will describe all of your random errors. But if the maximum and minimum do not go through your random errors, there must be some systematic errors within your experiment which you have not considered. That's powerful information. That middle uh, data point there, one to third data point, is miles off the rest. Why is it miles off the rest? Do we need to do more, more trials? Do we need to do more runs? This is great stuff leading into the evaluation. So this is the power of calibrating and using your random errors to calibrate for your systematic errors to talk about in your evaluation. That's where the high scoring uh, sixes and 24s come from. So you must comment on this to gain top marks in evaluation. What about powers? Powers. Um, I never knew this until researching this, this presentation and I felt better because Richard Thornley said exactly the same. So <laughs> we have 3.45 plus or minus 0 0.05 to the power of 1 over 3. So you could be doing an Arrhenius plot or something um, and you stood there thinking, how on earth do I propagate that? What on earth do I do with that? Well, just take the number times it by the power, 3.45 to the power of 1 over 3, happens to be 1.51. So we've got the actual value without the uncertainty. So how do we incorporate the uncertainty? Well, the power is 1 third, and if you times that by the uncertainty divided by the actual value, uncertainty divided by the value, 0 0.05, 3.45, get it into percent, it becomes 0.5%. That's the percent of the relative uncertainty. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 1.51, which was the result of 3.45 to the power of one third. Well, 1.51 was the answer, but that's we're 0.5% uncertain in that 1.51, which is 0 0.0076, which is uh, one to the four decimal places two. So we need to, one one sig fig. So it's 0 0.008 is the uncertainty on that. Pretty clever, right? I'm going to use that. <laughs> And then what about logs? Oh, this is cute. This is beautiful. Thank you to the physics people for teaching me this. So 
this is a, an experiment with uh, amps and uh, log values and extensions or lengths. I'm, I'm not sure what the hell they're doing here. It's physics. I'll, I'll stick to chemistry. So let's look at this first value. We've got 50 amps. Um, the length, I assume, is 2.6 plus or minus 0 0.2. That means the value is somewhere between 2.4 and 2.8. So the lower value is 2.4. Let's call that YL is 2.4. The upper value is 2.8, 2.6 plus 0.2. So if we take the log of the upper over the lower, log 2.8 over 2.4, use the mid-range thing again, divide it by 2, 0 0.06695 over 2 is plus or minus 0 0.03, one sig fig again. So this can be individual uncertainties when you are doing logs. That's great, right? I'm like, wow, that, that's brilliant. Same with ln, lon, natural logs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this one, we're taking the upper value. So we've got this one here, 3 plus or minus 0 0.2. Upper value is 3.2. Lower value is 2.8, given the uncertainty. ln of 3.2 upper over 2.8 lower. Mid-range again, over 2, is plus or minus 0 0.07. So you can plop that into your ln column for individual uncertainties. No moderator in the world is going to give you less than 6 out of 6 for treating your data in that manner. That is just that is just brilliant. Love it. Okay, at this point we'll have a quick look at the student's IA and um, see how she tracked her number. I know I shared this beforehand and uh, we will focus on significant figures and decimal places. Uh, this is activation energy for the briggs rauscher reaction. Um, I did share this before. If you've seen this, great. I will. Uh, this will be on the document hyperlinked when I uh, load it underneath the live stream. Um, wherever I see number, I'll stop and I'll pause. So here she's got a, a sequential uh, reaction mechanism that she's researched from someone called Bash, Castorini and Siders in 2003 with some K values for rate constants for the various reactions going on in the briggs rauscher reaction. It's quite a nice one. She's got a rate uh, equation, rate constant, pair, orders of reaction up there. Calculation of reaction of activation energy. She said how she's going to do it. She said she's going to plot it. She said that these are the temperatures. Um, the uncertainty is there. Students often miss uncertainties in the variable treatment. You must have uncertainties in the variable treatment. Wherever there's a number, look at this, beautiful. Wherever there's a number, there is percentage uncertainty, which is really nice. Let's get to the data table. Uh, glassware, consistent decimal places, 3.0 plus or minus 0 0.1, 50.0 plus or minus 0 0.5. Wherever you look, she has really listened to the advice and she has put everything into this to make sure she gets top marks. Throughout the method, 500 cm cubed plus or minus 5 cm cubed. Using a weighing scale, plus or minus 0 0.01. Wherever there is a number, there is an uncertainty. You'd, be, you'd have to work very hard to find a place where she's not put an uncertainty if the number is going to be used in a calculation. Clearly, if it's just, I put 300 cm cubed into a beaker, she doesn't need to put the calculation. But look at that, beautiful. Safety, environmental, ethical. Uh, we've got some raw data. Raw data here, we've already mentioned this one. Again, I wouldn't mark her down for that, but the fact the average has no DP arguably is an error. Um, she set out the calculations here beautifully. She told us she's going to do a standard deviation. That's really nice. Standard form, 6.82 by 10 to the minus three, three sig fig, three sig fig going in. That's really good. Lost, lost, yeah. Lost the average. Anyway, uh, that's all. That's all great. I think that's really that's really good. Exemplar calculation for the absolute uncertainty. Um, no one can really fault that. Should she put units in there? Do you notice the absolute uncertainty? So, mm, yeah, she should put units in there. We're not going to mark it down for that though. <laughs> um, rate of oscillation. We've looked at this one to use standard deviation. Now I've perhaps gone through L and K. She could have done a um, uncertainty on LNK and propagated the uncertainty there but last year I perhaps couldn't have told her to do that. 
we've already looked at the graph and let's just check that she's done a straight line plot. She has LNK one over T. Look at that, beautiful. So she's got the calculation. In the calculation, she's got the gradient uncertainty. She's used a bit of dy by dx differentiation to do that. And then she's got the percent uncertainty uh, from the gradient. Percentage error with literature value, literature take away calculated divided by the calculated. Uh, it should have been 57.3. She got 47.02. Delicious. So that's 21.9% uh, error, which is pretty good for a school laboratory. Talks about R squared, consistent decimal places throughout. I know I'm skimming through this. Again, I will link this at the bottom. You can have a look yourselves. Um, and in the evaluation, what do we see? We see dropping pipettes, uncertainty, measuring cylinder, everything, look, absolutely everything. As an uncertainty, absolute and percent. What was the effect and what's the improvement? As a moderator, you're just going tick, 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 tick. Beautiful. What's the improvements? What are the systematic errors? Where did they occur? Refers back to the research question. I would say that is a pretty solid. Uh, that would have been a high six, low seven in terms of grade for her IA part of her IB diploma in chemistry. So at the bottom of the document, I have given all the references that I've used and all of the uh, extension work for you to develop either as a student or as uh, to use with your teachers. I'm very indebted for all the people that uh, I've used within here <laughs> with or without permission. So uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope you found this, this useful and it may be of assistance to some November 20 kids uh, who are just finishing off their IA. If not, it may be of use to May 21 kids um, if it's still knocking around on YouTube. Okay, cool. So again, this full document will be underneath the video when I've posted it. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Uh, thanks, Olixa, for enjoying the streams. <laughs> much appreciated. And uh, we'll bid you a good evening. Stay well, stay safe. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.